Is the gym a safe place for your children? Tonight, news at 11. Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isratel here for Renaissance Periodization. As always, today's topic is what kind of lifting technique can reduce your chances of injury at the gym if you are training for hypertrophy and or strength? Let's get right into the meat and potatoes. What's on the menu today? First, we're gonna define what injury means, so we're all on the same page. Then we're gonna look at some injury data to see what kind of sports tend to be more injurious and what kind less. Some of this may surprise you. Number three, we're going to look into what technical factors, how you execute a lift, can increase or decrease your injury. And number four will be the actual recommendations of how to make sure you reduce your injury risk at the gym without simultaneously not training hard, because that's the easiest way, or just don't show up. And then lastly, we'll look at other gym injury factors that you really need to be checking the boxes on to make sure you're as safe as possible, not because you're a wuss and you wanna be safe for no damn reason, but because you want to be not injured so you can progress more, get more jacked, get stronger, so on and so forth. All right, so, Defining injury. Injury can be defined in very general as the deformation of body structures. This is the most general possible definition of injury and is not very useful. The definition becomes more useful as we go more specific. A sport injury can be defined as the deformation of body structures that reduces performance now in the sport or sets up a later performance reduction, right? Like you bruise your ankle during a run and you still hit a PR, you ran the fastest you ever have, but like the next day your ankle's bruised and it hurts and your performance is reduced. Okay. Micro injury is a sub-definition and that's the deformation of body structures at a very small scale. It's often undetectable, it doesn't hurt, it often does not impact your performance at all, and it occurs regularly in normal training it is healed between hard sessions and with deloads and active rest phases, and there's nothing to worry about. It's just a part of the process. So by definition, we're not trying to avoid all injury. We're just trying to avoid unnecessary macro injury. The next definition is macro injury. So there's micro injury, macro injury. Macro injury is the deformation of body structures at a large scale. Already sounds bad, and it is. It often is associated with pain, but not always. And it is often associated with a performance reduction, but not every single time. However, if it doesn't come with pain and or performance reduction and it occurs, if you keep doing what keeps making it happen, or if that thing is still just around, like you can partially slip a disc, that's a pretty big deal, but it might present with no pain or performance reduction because the, the disc is almost hitting the nerves it's not supposed to, whereas before it was really far, now it's really close. Might still be nothing, still a macro injury, by the way, but that's not a sustainable scenario, and it's very likely that if it's not attended to, eventually it will hit the nerves, and you're like, ah, what happened, right? And if you get a time machine in your body, a doctor could be like, that actually happened two months ago, but now this latest micro injury actually pushed it over the edge, right? So definitely, we don't want macro injuries. We want to prevent them to the extent that we're capable of without crapping away all of our ability to overload in sports. Sports are risky, so is weight training, but we're going to avoid all the risk that we can. Now, Another related term is a meso injury, you know, micro, meso, macro. That's just something Dr. James Hoffman of RP made up uh, when I was uh, t teaching a course and he trolled me about it. And it's not a real made up term, but I gotta say what's up to Dr. James. It'll be our inside joke, myself, James, and the rest of you folks on YouTube. So meso injury, that's the one you really don't want. Right in the middle, right between the eyes. Okay, so point two. Let's take a look at the injury data. Now, we're not going to give you a ton of numbers. You can actually look these up yourself. Uh, I just made it super simple for you guys and ranked a couple of representative sports on how high the injury risk is per exposure hour. So if you do one hour of weightlifting versus one hour of basketball, what is your chance for injury? There's no numbers here. I don't make it too complex. You can look these up yourself and most of the studies all align in a similar direction. Now, almost all of these are strength sports and weight training related sports, but I threw a couple in there just to illustrate uh, that weight training isn't actually that dangerous. So the most, uh, the least safe sport as far as I'm aware of in the United States on most metrics is cheerleading. We just say cheerleading is crazy dangerous. And there's a bunch of documentaries about this if you're interested. Why? And that's actually quite simple. So 
In gymnastics, people only really bound up or jump or elevate on under their own muscular power. So they don't ever go that high or go that fast. In cheerleading, basket tosses and partner assisted lifts means that you get to heights and at velocities you can't actually execute yourself. And to further complicate matters, you're relying on other people in a coordinated fashion to catch you on the way down. People in cheerleading regularly fall from like 30 feet and just hit the fucking mat. There's some shit you just won't be able to do anything about. All right, so cheerleading is an insane injury risk for reasons of incredibly high velocities once you hit the ground, tons of instability, tons of coordination problems. And we're going to talk about in a bit how that makes sense in theory. And we're going to try to make uh, strength training and hypertrophy training in the gym the least like cheerleading possible in those respects. Get to see what I mean in just a sec. Next, just as another sample sport, is basketball. Okay, people always think, oh my God, like people I'm sure watch your training videos and like your relatives, your aunt is like, oh my God, Billy, that's 300 pounds. Like, aren't you going to get hurt? Like, she's never going to say that at a basketball game. If you play hoops with your friends outside, she's going to be like, oh, well, dude, it's great. Here's, you know, here's a lemonade. She's never going to be like, oh, basketball, you could, you could get hurt. You could get way more hurt playing basketball, more likely than in weight training. Weight training is incredibly safe. After basketball, next example is Highland Games and Strongman. They get hurt quite a bit more than weightlifters who get hurt quite a bit more than powerlifters who get hurt considerably more than bodybuilders. Okay, Bodybuilding is very safe and is probably one of the safest hard physical activities you can do and is definitely the safest thing you can do in the gym. Notice the pattern here. Highland Games Strongman has a dynamic component, has an unpredictable component, lots of movement. Weightlifting, Good dynamic component, you're not jumping off the ground very far, and the movements are very predictable. Not a lot of room for error. Powerlifting, even safer, I mean, really not a lot of room for error there. There are high forces in powerlifting that are a very big concern, but you're, they're so uncontrolled and so in very positions you're used to executing, the range area is not that high. And what does bodybuilding have? Neither the very, very high forces of weightlifting or powerlifting, not the dynamics of weightlifting. Uh, it's really pretty safe, right? So. We can break all these down, give it some thought, and come up with, oh, about four injury risk factors that are relevant in technique, okay? Factor number one is the magnitude of the absolute forces applied, okay? If you are using a technique that requires you to lift more weight, for example, partial squatting versus full squat, okay, the absolute magnitude of the forces is higher, and especially if this is applied to smaller and weaker structures that are not normally used to taking this force. A really easy example, if you just think about in all of sports, is using two legs to jump up as high as you can and then tucking one and landing on one leg. It can be done, but like, you know, if someone had to ask you, hey, do you think it's more safe to land on two legs or one? You'd be like, yeah, two, and you'd be completely correct, okay? Really high forces applied to a really small structure, generally speaking, increases their injury risk to that structure. Right? There's a structure only has so much connective tissue of such a strength, the more force you apply, the more chance something goes like this. And if it's a really tiny structure and you apply the same amount of force, much easier chance. You, you, don't, you don't hang a bowling ball on a string, that, that whole example. Number two, and these are not necessarily in order of importance or anything, they're all pretty important. The velocities achieved. And the velocity achieved one really is does take the cake. If we were to rank these, it'd be number one. Okay, The higher the velocities, the higher the energy transmission into tissue when you have to slow down. Sometimes you don't slow down uh, in accordance with your will because not only do velocities, when you reach high velocities, when you slow down, there's a high chance that you, higher chance that you'll expose to ultra high forces uh, and then you'll get hurt. Like, you know, if your velocity, if you're running, every time you hit the ground with your feet, that's a ton of force. People pull hamstrings all the time. Sprinting, they don't exactly pull hamstrings all the time, even in weightlifting, not nearly as often, right? That's because of the super high forces involved from the high velocities. Now, it's also true that the higher the velocity of the event or the movement, the more chance that a technical blunder will occur, okay? Like if you're bench pressing and it's slow when you start to drift this way, you can correct it, right? And it's just not that hard to guide a bar that's going at a fucking like <laughs> a tenth of a mile an hour or some shit. Like how much of a technique blunder could you possibly have? You approach in real time. But if you do something like weightlifting and the velocities are really high, there's more of a chance that when you mess up technique by a little, it can get really out of hand. 
The ultimate example, not in the gym, but in the on the track, is if you lose your footing when you're doing like a hundred meter sprint, oh, holy shit. <laughs> like you, you can be in some deep shit. If you lose your footing when you're jogging, like, you, you know, you'll fall maybe, maybe not even, you can probably rescue yourself, right? Number three, the variation of force exposure. So even if the forces are very high, if you're used to those high forces in those structures and in, in those positions on which they're being imposed, your structures and positions are adapted to those forces and the injury risk is actually not that high at all, right? Which is why when you lift a ton of weight and your aunt goes, ah, Billy, like what she doesn't get is that you've been doing that for weeks and weeks and you're totally fine in those positions and your tissues are stronger and you're actually very unlikely to get hurt. But if forces come out of left field where they're usually not detected from, there's not really an adaptation to that and the chance of injury goes up considerably, right? So if you're normally benching like this and you're touching right here, if you kind of lose a bench press a little on technique and you go down to here and you try to rescue it, ooh, that's a different set of forces and vectors on the pack and it could pull on something that's not used to being pulled on with that high of a force, your chance of injury goes up, right? And then lastly, exceeding your normal structural range of motion. This one's obvious, okay? Like if you land on one leg wrong and it goes the wrong way, knee, you're getting hurt, okay? So a lot of times don't put yourself in positions that uh, do that. You know, if you have really lax knees and you're doing hack squats and you're purposefully trying to jam your knees out at the hack squat at the top, ugh, we've all seen that leg press video. And if we haven't, now we have, because I know you're Googling leg press accident lady knees buckle back video. Don't do it. If you've never seen it, don't do it to yourself. But it can happen incredibly rare. But generally speaking, we don't ever want to do any exercises or any techniques that risk uh, our structural range of motion from being uh, exceeded. For example, if someone's like, hey, we're going to do shoulders, let's do dumbbell push jerks, where you get under the dumbbell, you push it up, and then you also do the jerk component, and there's a chance that you can hyperextend your elbow, right? Versus if you're just doing, you're working shoulders, and you're just doing nice, slow, concentric shoulder presses, there's not really that high of a chance you're going to hyperextend your elbow, because, you know, the bar actually stabilizes both, and also the velocity is not that high, so there's not a chance that you can get into those crazy, weird positions. If you're doing lifting in the gym that all chronically puts you in really risky positions, Eh, you might want to give it some thought. So, which brings us to our next point. How do we actually reduce the injury risk in the gym? What principles can we follow? And there's good news, four of them, that make sure that whatever we're doing in the gym, be it training for strength hypertrophy, we do it as safely as we can without sacrificing our ability to get stronger or bigger. First, never use more load than it takes to accomplish the task which almost always means using fuller ranges of motion because then the external load is lower. I don't care who you are. If you walk 600 pounds out of a squat rack, the injury risk is X, Y, Z. If you walk with the same strength, same muscle, same everything, 400 pounds out of the squat rack, even if you go lower with it, the injury risk is less. Absolute forces matter. One of the most straightforward ways to get hurt is to use crazy amounts of weight. Sometimes if you're a power lifter, and you're already going to depth, it's just something you're gonna to have to uh, uh, accept. But if you're cutting your depth in order to use more weight, you don't have to, you are risking injury that much more. A big deal here is if you slip up in a full range of motion dumbbell press, whoop, you did this, you can either save it or dump it, probably no problem. The absolute force just isn't that high because the dumbbells aren't that heavy. But if you had your friends load the dumbbells onto you and you're only doing them from here to here, if you slip up and it goes this way, uh, you might be in some deep shit. So it's not just that the forces executed normally at any one time necessarily hurt you, they could, but it's if you stumble with 600 in the squat, ugh, that shit is going south fast. If you stumble with 400 and you're used to doing a full four range motion, you might be able to just get out of it or actually just step forward a little bit and save it and come up, right? Not a big deal. Number two, huge, control the weight because we're talking about powerlifting, and bodybuilding, gaining for, gaining strength and gaining size, uh, controlling the weight is a big part of it and you don't get any benefits out of being crazy dynamic, just none. So you want slower eccentrics, especially in hypertrophy training, consider pausing, which is required in powerlifting in most cases, especially for the bench press and the deadlift. And you can do a rapid concentric, that's totally cool. So you can go super fast on the way up, but keep it under control. Not like dynamic fast where you ballistically throw the bar away, but, mm -mm and then slow it down towards the end, so on and so forth. Number three, standardize your technique. Your technique should look very similar session to session to session to session because this prevents you from exposing your body to unadapted force factors that it's just not used to, 
okay? And prevents you from having small structure overloading because sometimes you can be lifting with larger structures and then you push the bar wrong and it puts a lot of force on one small structure, maybe one side of your pack or something like that. You don't want any of that. If you have a technique that sometimes a bench like this, sometimes a bench like that, sometimes a bench like this, who the hell knows? Your body is like, you know, you're really kind of rolling the dice. But if you bench in a pretty similar way with some natural variation, you're going to be in a position where you keep doing that, your body's going to get really adapted against injury in that regard. And if you keep being in that safe zone, you're sort of good to go, right? This also means not just standardize your technique, but standardize good technique. And good technique according to injury risk is not heave hoeing the weight which means if you heave ho the weight and you do momentum and you do cheating, and you guys all know what that means, and there's tons of videos on RP about what good technique really is in, in other regards, if you are cheating and you're doing bad technique, you're increasing forces because nobody cheats to use less weight, let's be honest. You're exposing small structures to large forces, cheat curling, okay? You're doing some shit that you should be squatting, but you're doing it with your, with your bicep tendon. Bad idea. That's why people get on camera getting hurt doing cheat curls. Um, increasing velocities. I mean, literally, cheat curling increases the velocity of the motion. And it's not the problem. The problem isn't that it, the velocity concentrically is higher. The problem is on the eccentric when you have super high velocity and you're slowing it down with your bicep tendon. It's like kind of asking for injury. And of course, you're risking unaccustomed ranges of motion because if you start cheating, you have no guarantee of where the bar is going to go because it's, it's by definition out of control. So if you're doing this and then that and then this, one of those times you can get into a position your body's not used to and then and then what, right? Your chance of injury elevates. Not a ton, but enough that if you do it over and over and over like that, you're going to get into some deep shit. Lastly, if you want to increase your range of motion, and if you do, you should watch our last video on this series, which is the mobility stuff. You have to do it slowly because radically expanding your range of motion is a bad idea and can get you hurt, right? So if you want to dig a little deeper, whether it's in the squat or your dips or something, go an inch deeper, <laughs> get it, uh, every week, okay, every two weeks. Don't just all of a sudden uh, go five inches deeper. <laughs> uh, it's tough, tough day. Don't go way, way deeper and, oh my God, my pec, right? Well, why the fuck would you go completely unaccustomed depth all of a sudden with your normal load or even with a slightly reduced load. Whenever you have a certain technique and a certain range of motion, if you want to add range of motion, don't just retool your shit and do it all at once. If you do, do that with incredibly lightweight and pyramid back up. But if you're using remotely loading that you would use in a hypertrophy or strength setting, go a little bit deeper every week, every week, every other week, every other, you know, every two weeks or something like that. And then eventually you'll be doing much more range of motion, keeping you safer and more effective on the net balance, but you'll get there slowly and gradually. All right. Lastly, can't leave this off without some other gym injury factors that absolutely do play a role that don't exactly have to do with technique, right? But sometimes they're very related. Number one, fuckery. Okay, doing dumb shit is stupid. Don't do it. Like if your friends are like, hey, it's all this cool exercise, do you wanna try it? No, I don't, all right? If I'm gonna try a cool exercise, it's gonna be slowly warming up and seeing how it feels and doing it for higher reps and feeling out the technique and then progressively overloading it weeks and weeks and weeks later down the line. Eh, who the hell does that, all right? And don't do shit that you know is stupid. Like someone's like, hey, I bet you can't cat back deadlift this. And you're like, bet you I can. And you're not warmed up and like, ah, you do it and your vertebral column shoots out the back, hitting someone in the face. And you know, you're gonna have a lawsuit there because they lost half their face. So basically, don't do stupid shit and you know what that is, okay? Stick to your plan, ease into stuff. Accidents are probably the highest source of actual gym injuries. Uh, so stay alert for other lifters. Don't walk into other people's weights. Make sure other people don't walk into you while you're lifting. Don't drop weight on your feet. That's really super common. I've almost done that shit about a trillion times. Get a spotter. Folks, get a spotter. It's not that hard and it can save you from considerable injury. Use collars when you have to, because if your weight starts slipping off, I've actually seen someone eat shit like that before. Uh, was, gentleman was doing like a Bulgarian squat and he wasn't collared in and one of the weights started slipping and then that tilted him and he tilted the other way and he smashed his thumb between the barbell and the supports. Uh, and it, we saw actual bone, white bone. It was so, sort of trippy. He lived, but holy shit, I wouldn't want that kind of injury, right? And this is kind of important, make sure your lifting surface uh, and your lifting implement, whatever you're lifting, has a high degree of friction, okay? I've seen people squat low and then when they come up, they slip. I've seen people's feet slip back and forth on the floor. Holy shit, is that a terrible way? First of all, that can injure you disastrously because it's gonna tear your groin all to pieces. And 
what's dog shit way to get hurt? Cause you weren't even like doing anything wrong per se. You just risked it for no reason. Like if I don't have a stable surface to lift on, real talk, I don't lift. I mean, it's not worth it at all. Point number three, you have a certain load you're lifting in training. Of course you wanna train with more. It's important to go slowly and add loads slowly if you do rapid load escalation, that's increase in forces, unaccustomed, your chances of injury are that much higher, okay? Usually happens when you're feeling good too. You squat at 300 and you're easy. 315, easy. Should you go for 330 that day? I would say probably not. Can it be easy? Do a little lighter session the next one, session after, pyramid back up and maybe go to 325. Look, the strength you get at any one time isn't because you're like, today, Today, this is the only time I'll be strong enough to do this. Well, if you're training right, that shit takes like 10 years to get up to your maximum strength. Then you have multiple years at the top where you can time your peaks and retry and get your best weights. There's never a time to you're like, now I put 30 pounds on the bar. Put 10 and the next week come in and put another 10. Now, there's no rush because those times where you shouldn't have are really easy to see in 2020 hindsight. There's hard as fuck to see going forward, right? You go to 315 on the squat, and everything goes well. You go to 330 and you pull your attitude a little bit. Fuck, 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 take it. You guys take the weight and you're like, shit, fuck, fuck. Like, I probably shouldn't have done that, right? And they're like, well, yeah, probably not. Like, I should have told myself not to do that. Well, here I am telling you not to do that. Don't do that. Ease in and you'll get all the strength you're getting and it'll just be slow and steady. I know it requires patience, that sucks, but that's the reality versus injury trade off. Number four, don't escalate volume rapidly. Really good way to get hurt is do a deload week, do very low volume, your body doesn't get uh, gets used to that low volume, and then you like go poof, crazy high volume right away, ease in. So don't add like four or five sets every session, like session to session to session or week to week, add like one or two if you even have to add volume, okay? So first of all, don't add any more volume than you need to. And uh, lastly, just add a small amount of volume each time. You'll get where you're going. You don't have to add 10 sets every workout or something like that, or just go from zero to 60. Uh, that can get you hurt. And it's very, very well demonstrated in the scientific literature. That's a huge, huge problem. And actually a bunch of sports. If you like train soccer players and they do a little bit of practice, a little bit of practice, and you ramp up the practices, tons of people get hurt right away. There's another reason, lastly, why people get hurt, and that's cumulative fatigue. Your fatigue rises as you train, and unless you do off days, light sessions, deloads, active rest phases, when needed, when that fatigue gets a little too high, especially when your performance starts to crest, that's time to back off. If you your performance starts to crest and you don't start not hitting PRs, and you're still grinding, 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 your tissues are accumulating micro trauma, micro injuries from the first slide. And your micro injuries start to accumulate as more and more and more of them. And imagine like you have like, <laughs> this is the stupidest analogy. Oh, no, okay. I'm not going to use that. I was going to say a piece of cheese, but that's stupid. Let's say a piece of paper. Okay. And you have a piece of paper taped to one thing and taped to another. And you start poking holes in that piece of paper and you pull the tape. How much force it takes to pull the tape apart is going to be less and less and less with how many holes you've poked into the shit. And you can poke enough holes. All you have to do is go and that's it. Like sometimes you're training and you're not really particularly hitting PRs, but you're really fatigued. You're really tired. You've been, your quads have been sore and sore and sore weeks and weeks and weeks. And all of a sudden you're doing leg presses with a normal amount of weight. And at the bottom of the fifth rep, your quads, something goes. You're like, oh, what the hell? What do you mean what the hell? You haven't recovered in months. You've just been pushing and pushing and pushing and micro tearing and micro tearing and micro tearing. Micro tears can expand into macro tears, especially when they connect with other micro tears, right? Like putting little tiny uh, holes in your windshield and then all of a sudden someone hits it and it goes and one of those cracks. I'm like, where the fuck do you think that came from, right? So manage your fatigue. Make sure that when you're cresting in your performance and you feel really beat up, Take some time away from harder training. Do some easier training. Really, really heal periodically. We've got tons of videos on that. Come back. And when you come back, slowly ramp up in both load and volume. Use good technique to make sure that you're minimizing your injury risk as much as possible while still training as hard as possible. Folks, if you have questions, comments, concerns, we have a comment section. Like, subscribe, whatever YouTube shit people say. See you next time.